Well, to help us out in this session, we, which is going to be chaired by Lisa Hinton, we have a number of speakers, but we're going to start with someone who's both uh, deeply wise and very special. Dame Elizabeth Zanyonyu, who discussed with Lisa earlier, because unfortunately she can't be here in person today, the service that she pioneered in the 1970s to support families affected by sickle cell and by thalassemia. And can I just take the moment to say how thrilled everyone is that Elizabeth was recently awarded the Order of Merit uh, by the King. I just have to keep saying King rather than Queen, uh, by the King. Uh, and she's the third nurse, I think, to get this honour. Uh, and she joins a group which includes Florence Nightingale and Dame Cicely Saunders. So a very special moment indeed to have her in that very select group. And we congratulate her. We're going to hear a shorter video from her. There is going to be a much longer in conversation style video uh, with Elizabeth, which is going to be on demand later on. So can we just hear from Dame Elizabeth, please? I'm very honored to uh, be joining you. To, to understand, I need to just um, uh, put it in a historical context because I'm now well retired. And we're talking about the 1970s, 1970s London, Northwest London, Brent, to be accurate. And I was working informally with a consult, the late now consultant hematologist, Dr. Misha Brozovic. And she was very concerned about the lack of awareness by staff and also by patients and affected families about sickle cell disease. She had realized there was a significant number of patients coming into the hospital with complex issues. And to be blunt, she wasn't happy with the care that the patients were receiving. So she set about trying to improve it. First of all, by educating uh, staff and I went to a couple of her lectures because I had an interest, a personal interest and a professional interest. And I can explain that later if you like. But I asked so many questions at the two lectures that Misha gave that she stopped me in the corridor and to cut a very long story short, and this is what happens, I think, how we, we start working in a multidisciplinary way, I hope she asked if I would like to work with her. She was aware, my background was health visiting, it was community nursing. I'm also mixed race. I was very, starting to become very interested in the political, with a small p, political issues in health. And I had already become interested in genetic conditions, but it was just, I didn't do anything about it, I just read about them. And I had come across this comment in a 1976 genetic counseling book. And if, if you don't mind, I'll quote it to you. It's very short. It was entitled Genetic Counseling by Alan Stevenson and Claire Davison. And it said, sickle cell anemia is not of great consequence to us in the context of genetic counseling in the United Kingdom. The sickling tray, and sickle cell anemia appear to be confined to peoples of African and Eastern origin. And I'm quoting from my memoirs and I comment, this shocking ignorance was a key driver that led me to travel all the way to the US to access training in sickle cell. And particularly sickle cell, I, thalassemia was part of it. But thalassemia had had Professor Bernadette Medell driving uh, services in, in the UK. In Brent, sickle cell anemia was, was the major inherited hemoglobinopathy, as we say. And that's what it did. It drove me to America, not to work. I went there on holiday, but I had heard that as a result of the civil rights 
uh, activities as a result of um, very, very passionate health professionals uh, and many others, things had started to happen. And uh, a, a law was enacted that released funds for a network of comprehensive sickle cell centers. And it was this comprehensive approach that I learned about when I went to the United States, particularly to Los Angeles and San Francisco. And that's where I discovered that nurses, and they were particularly African-American nurses, were specializing in sickle cell. Up until that point, I had thought it was hematologists and pediatricians. So the blood specialists and the uh, children's doctors would be the key professionals that would be caring for the families. I thought, hold on, nurses, I'm a nurse. That nurse looks like me. This is, this is what I can contribute. Came back, told Dr. Brozovic, and that's how we started. And I think I always realized that I would have to have one foot in the community and one foot in the hospital. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about how this approach, this community approach, ensured more equitable care for those children and their families? It ensured more equitable care because the concerns, and some of these concerns, if they were not addressed, could have led to fatalities. I mean, this isn't, these were not add-ons, lux luxury extras for the sort of provision that the NHS was, was providing. It, it was plugging sometimes huge gaps in the provision of care within the NHS. And I like to think what I and others, because I really have to stress this, that um, it, it was very, it really was a team effort, not only within our own area in Brent, but a lot of other people coming on board who really, who really liked this idea. And, and when I say a lot of people, it wasn't just health professionals, it was individuals in the community. It was establishing the Sickle Cell Society, for example. And that would be, um, not, not initially, I mean, health professionals were heavily involved initially as, as, as does happen, but within a few years, it, it was the families that were driving the charity, which was great because I, I remember being made very, very uncomfortable at many meetings with families that I knew very well. They trusted me, they respected me, but they, they were highlighting inadequacies and they would get very, very distressed and very, very angry. Could you share what lessons you have for others from setting up this service back in the 1970s? Yes, I've had time to reflect on this, as you can imagine, and I've come up with three Ps. And uh, the, 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 that is personal. Don't have any anxieties about leading on issues that are personal to you or your family or your, uh, your own communities. Um, I found my father when I was 25 and I then found out that I had a cousin with sickle cell anemia living in this country. I can tell you something that really does make you sit up. I mean, I was doing stuff, but it really, it really uh, propelled me more. So that's the personal, the professional as a health visitor. I was ashamed that my professional educators had not included this condition in our curriculum. I was not prepared. I was not competent and confident to, to work as a health visitor in diverse communities in, in respect of this condition because we, it just wasn't on the curriculum. Um, so that was personal, professional, and the final one is political. And I would say political with a small p because some health professionals get scared when you talk po politics, but politics is what drives our, our, our health services. And I'm not talking about, you know, you, you have to be out on the streets glued to whatever you want to be glued to. No, no, Polit politics with a small p is accepting that as health professionals and others, we, we, I think we have a duty to be aware of whether the provisions our families are receiving are equitable. That in itself is political. And you can take it further by challenging it if you, if you so wish. I, I, I would never uh, you know, tell people exactly what they've got to do. But from my own 
lessons, if you like, my own experience. It was only by joining forces with like-minded people, some of whom were in the health service, some of whom weren't, some of whom were much more political. My goodness, those were the people, all of us helped to open those doors. I think it's an extraordinary privilege uh, to have uh, and to hear a conversation with Dame Elizabeth. Uh, I said she was wise. Now you know why I said she was wise. Uh, uh, really an extraordinary influence. And the Sickle Cell Society continues to do um, wonderful work. Um, Lisa, I'm sure that that was a, a, a treat for you. And just to say again, there's a longer version of that interview which will be available. But Lisa, would you now introduce your panelists and your speakers? Thank you, Vivian. Um, yeah, it was indeed a great privilege to meet Elizabeth um, a couple of weeks ago and hear more about her background. And I would recommend both watching the longer video, but also reading her autobiography, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, but I've now got uh, an absolutely uh, fascinating and international panel um, to extend this discussion. Uh, individually, they have been involved in instrumental in making change happen inclusively in their health systems in both the United States and here in the UK. Uh, and they're deeply involved in thinking about how we can design health systems that are more equitable and responsive to digital change. So we have joining us now uh, Dr. Steve Tierney, who's Senior Medical Director at South Central Foundation, which is a non-profit healthcare organization serving a population of around 60,000 individuals in, um, in Alaska. So Alaskan Native and American Indian people in South Central Alaska. Uh, and he supports the community through what's known as the NUCA system of care that he was instrumental in establishing. And his colleague, Barbara Sapper, is also joining us. She's a senior manager, um, at, but also uh, makes use of the healthcare system for her family. We then have uh, Dr. Bex Fisher, who is a, a GP here in the English NHS. But currently, very luckily, and you'll get a clue from um, the background to her video, she's uh, on a Harkness Fellowship uh, in Healthcare Policy and Practice in uh, California. And she's working on a suite of uh, projects around equitable access to high quality primary care. And last but certainly not least, uh, Pratesh Mystery is joining us from the policy team at the King's Fund, where he focuses on how evidence-based digital tools and technologies can uh, improve health and care and uh, critically accesses technology and, and questions whether it is indeed a silver bullet or, or we need to think about it more critically. So I'm going to come to them each in turn and ask them to give us uh, two or three minutes um, about their experiences of, of setting up or thinking about systems of care. And I come, come first to, to Steve Tierney. Steve, over to you. Oh, thanks very much. Um, well, I think uh, what happened to us is we recognized uh, you know, in the 90s, in the 1990s, that we had a, a highly dysfunctional system that was both disease focused and visit sort of administered. In other words, we did everything based on a disease and you did so with a visit with a practitioner for your fill in the blank, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what happened is, is we had an endless number of cues to manage as a consequence uh, with all of these things. And God forbid you had four or five of these diseases as you saw the cardiologist or the rheumatologist or the neurologist, et cetera. So we realized that you know to get better, we needed to be more accessible. So what we did was completely sort of wiped the slate as it were for the system and rebuilt it saying that there was no such thing as an established process in the health system. Everything that we did that we measured was based on customer experience and customer outcome. So in other words, if they were getting their A1C measured and in control, if they were getting their uh, diabetes meds refilled, if they were getting all their vaccinations, all their cancer screens, and if they had access on the same day as they called for their appointment every single day, and we reduce their visits to the emergency room and to admissions to the hospital, those were the metrics that we said, we will adjust whatever we need to do to make sure those things improve. 
And it meant, though, that we had to be open to any of our processes within the health system were open to renegotiation multiple times a day if necessary. Well, what happened is after a while, we realized that instead of queuing people in different spaces to different locations to see different practitioners, there were some practitioners whose work clustered together very, very frequently. And so we started to then integrate those practitioners together in one space to say, we're going to have a composite offering for the high volume, high frequency, highly associated type services like mental health, home visiting nurse, dietitian and health education, or pharmacy services, or midwives. And we cluster them together in a business unit. And we realized for the population, we would only actually see about 15 to 20% of the population in any given year with any frequency whatsoever. About half the population rarely generated a visit in a year. Uh, but what we found is most of our work were clustered amongst the top tier, the top 10 to 15 to maybe 20%. And we realized that uh, adjusting to their needs, not in a standardized protocol, but more in a customized, individually tailored fashion, was a more likely way to effectively close whatever their problem was, as opposed to simply shifting them to another service, mitigating risk, and making sure that we weren't blamed for whatever went wrong. It was more about did the individual get their needs met in a quick, effective, efficacious way to their satisfaction? And I think that's where we continue to live today. Thank you, Steve, for that um, great introduction. So uh, can I come to Barbara, who uh, works in South Central, but also uh, I know that you use it uh, for yourself and your family. What's it like being a patient, a user of the system? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um Lahishu Barbara Duchta e the Honk Alhu Chile Kesh Kalhu. Hello, my name's Barbara. Um I am Iak and I'm from the Raven clan. Um the Iak people are from Southeast Alaska. Um, and we're a really small group of people. My mom grew up in um a town called Cordova, Alaska, and she's one of nine siblings. Um, seven made them to adulthood. Um, two passed away at a very young age, um, and one can speculate it's due to lack of access to healthcare and healthcare facilities like we have today. Um, my, I grew up in the old system, as we call it, um, <clears throat> the Alaska Native Hospital downtown. And I vividly remember walking in and I had a car accident <clears throat> and a concussion, excuse me. And, um, waiting in the emergency room for eight, nine, 10 hours um, while uh, individuals are getting pulled back ahead of you. And the only real access, they had primary care and a bunch of uh, primary care docs doing really good things, but you couldn't get an appointment same day like Dr. Tierney was mentioning um, and creating that access for our customer owners. And so um, you would see your aunties and uncles, you'd pack a lunch just to get seen for a sore throat or um, a head injury or anything like that. Fast forward today, I have two, uh, two I wanna call them babies, but they're not, they're 14 and 11. And they've grown up in the, the new system in where access to care is almost immediate. My son had chronic ear infections. Um, we had a relationship with our provider such that can you get him here in 20 minutes um, to be seen? I'm going to have an opening. Um, and I could do that. I could pick him up from daycare, run him over to the doctor and be seen almost immediately um, as to not have lifelong impacts on his hearing and in and, and his in his health. Um, my other hat is as an employee, as the director of human resources, and really thinking about how do you get a workforce to move in the same direction and still think with that innovative hat on where the services we're offering today is not the services we're going to be offering next year. And how, how do we get them to be okay with that? 
and all move in the same direction at one time. And so um, that's always our goal is to be moving in improvement and innovation as one of our foundations of South Central Foundation. Fantastic. Thank you, Barbara, for that, for both that sort of dual perspective, which is really, really um, insightful for us. I'm going to come now to Bex. Um, you're currently in California, but, um, you know, your your day job, your normal job is, is a GP in, in the English NHS. Uh, tell us about your perspectives on, on kind of developing primary care and what we need to think about in terms of um, making it uh, more equitable. Thanks, Lisa. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak. I am talking to you from San Francisco, but I'm going to speak from an NHS perspective. Um, and I just want to zoom out slightly from the amazing examples we've heard of specific services and think about how health systems can be, but aren't often, structured to enable us to deliver new care models equitably and innovatively. And my first point is this. We can't think about new care models in isolation from thinking about our existing models of care. So what's our start point? In NHS general practice, our start point is the existence and persistence of the inverse care law. So what I mean by that, and I'm just going to speak about a couple of health foundation examples over the past couple of years, is that practices in our most deprived areas have the least funding and the least staffing. So in England, practicing the most deprived 20% of areas receive about 7% less funding than practicing the most affluent 20%. And a GP working in, sorry, I've got a slight tickle, hang on. Sorry about that. GP working in the most affluent 20% of areas will be on average responsible for about 10% fewer patients. So these gaps on workforce, on funding, aren't narrowing. And a brief aside here, just to say those inequities aren't inevitable. <clears throat> They're the result of poor policies, in this case, around funding and resource distribution. So second point, how is our start point going to affect our ability to deliver new, new care models? Well, based on what I've just told you about general practice in England, it's pretty easy, right? General practice is struggling all over the country right now. So in some ways, this isn't my best example. But if you think about how our resources are distributed, practices don't have equal headroom to think about the challenges they face or to come up with innovative new ways to solve them. So in some of our most deprived areas where innovation to improve the services practice deliver is most needed, the resources are not there to help us think about how to do that equitably. We've got the fewest opportunities to spend time developing approaches which might eventually help us. And so my third and final point, and these are pretty straightforward, right, is that at a health system level, we have to focus much more on equitable resourcing. So in general practice, this isn't a problem exclusive to general practice, clearly. The inverse care law means that our resources are inversely proportional to where they're needed. And of course, there are incredible examples from across the country of practices doing amazing things in very tough conditions, of innovatively delivering new care models. But I think they're often based on heroic leadership, things that we can't necessarily replicate everywhere. And we can't, and I would suggest shouldn't be relying on that type of heroic leadership. I'd argue that instead as a health system, and I think particularly having spent some time now in the US where maybe it's harder to do things at whole system level because things are even more fragmented than they are in the NHS. We have this opportunity to think about how we resource our whole system equitably so that individual providers are much more able to think about how they can introduce new care models for their population. But we have to do that with equitable resource allocation as a basis. So a very simple point, really, and I'm afraid it does come back to money, workforce, but those things are essential ingredients for delivering new care models and doing so equitably. And I'll leave it there for now. Brilliant. Thanks, Bex. That's such a great overview of, of, of your thinking and your work. I'm going to come now to Pratesh. Now, Pratesh, I know policymakers often talk about digital health and digital technologies as being the silver bullet that's going to solve a lot of these issues. Uh, but you think about that very critically. Tell us a little bit about some of the thinking and the work that you're doing in this area. Sure. Thank you, Lisa. So, yeah, we're, we're doing quite a bit of thinking around this kind of space. Um, I suppose where, where I'm landing right now is digital can exclude and, and we need to acknowledge that. But we also need to remember that traditional services do also. Um, and where we need to drive towards is combining 
experiences and, and ways of delivering care to get better outcomes and better experience for staff and patients. So we talk a lot about the basic barriers to digital care. I, I think a, an earlier speaker talk, talked about that. But we find that it's very complex. So it, we talk a lot about devices and data and digital skills, but actually, you know, some younger people can be very much excluded when they don't have a personal space to be able to have an online consultation, for example. And it comes down to very simple things. So it needs a little bit of a change of perspective. You know, it's not about digital first or physical first. It's about a no wrong door perspective. It's, it's about patient led or person led combined with clinical need and risk. Um, and, and that's, yeah, we talk a lot about access, but actually the, a lot of our tools that we use are, are also can drive inequalities. So simple tools like pulse oximetry, I mean, it can, can have varying use depending on skill, skin color. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about AI. AI can see things that, that you know, people can't in many ways. So we see chest uh, X-ray images and you can pick up protected characteristics of individuals. And, and you know, there, there's a lot of things that happen within data and digital that we're not sure what's coming through. So I think underpinning all of the technology is the evidence base, the research and the diversity in the evidence base to try and understand where it is having a good impact where it's having a not so good impact and how do we mitigate that it's great to have the evidence around efficacy but it's also around how we mitigate against the negative outcomes or the negative impacts and then also there's um there's a lot of work that needs to be done around how we start making services more inclusive overall so how to work with communities and take a human designed approach um, the NHS did some amazing work around vaccine hesitancy, for example, really going out to communities, going out to people, listening and acting upon that, going to places of worship, driving buses into communities to deliver vaccines. You know, it's really different way of doing things that we need to start bringing into the system to work with people to understand how care can better be delivered for them. Um, so we're seeing, seeing some of that in the NHS. We're seeing people going out to pubs and markets and understanding people's data sensitivities and what they want from the service. And I think underpinning it, I suppose my bottom line is digital health, you know, it provides huge possibilities, but it's not a silver bullet on its own. We need to work with people to deliver solutions that work for them. Thank you, Pratesh. Um, I'm going to come back to Steve and ask you to reflect on, we were talking about health systems of very different sizes and uh, what, what lessons you might have from the work that you did in, in your communities for uh, a health system that's the size of, of the English or the Scottish or the Welsh NHS. I actually don't think there's any difference at all. Um, uh, it means that your population is what it is you will see the top 15% or so of the population. So regardless of how large or small your population is, you're going to be uh, need to be attentive to a small percent, but that means something very different. It means you have to know their names. It means you can't build something that would be relevant for the entire general population since it's not going to apply to about 85% of them. So you need to have a plan for what would be a reasonable and prudent process for the larger group. Uh, and then what would be your more tailored uh, approach to a much more targeted group. But it means you can't just say people of this age, of this gender, of this ethnicity, or of this postal code, we're going to treat thusly. Since it would not apply at all, it assumes they're all the same and they never are. So what we do is we say we rarely move people from one location to another, if at all possible. What we will do is try to say, we're going to keep you here. We're going to close whatever issues you have out without transfer, without requeuing, without reassessment. We actually do very little assessments. Uh, what we do is we say, what is the problem specifically that you have? And let's work on closing that problem to your satisfaction reasonably. Um, as opposed to saying, let's write down what your problem is and send you to someplace else so that they can attend to it. We, we say, let's keep you here. Uh, but it also means that we have to say AI is not going to help us because AI is generalized across general populations of which you would have a very, very different answer 
for someone who has no access to the GP in the last five years, who's 35 years old, to someone who's had 25 visits to the GP in the last one year and six visits to the A&E. Even though they may be the same age and same gender and even same postal code, you would have, uh, and maybe even the same job type or income, uh, you would have very, very radically different approaches to each one, but you have to know the difference. What we've, what we've found is every single individual person who clusters in a certain use category or a certain uh, visit clustering is known to all services so that we can adjust to all of them. We don't hide the GP's work from the behavioral health or vice versa. It is all transparent to the uh, organization so that we can actually strategically adjust to what do we need to do next. Thanks, Steve. That's really, really insightful. We've got just a couple of minutes left. I'm going to come to, to Bex and then Pratesh to give us uh, one key takeaway from their work and their thinking that we need to be thinking about designing new models of care inclusively. Um, first, I'll come to Bex. Thanks. I think there's an individual and a system level question for folk who might be listening, who are policymakers, um, hell, even politicians. What can you do to more equitably resource your systems to ensure that new models of care can be delivered, not just by those who already have lots, um, but how can you give more to those who need more to do this important work? For those individually, I think there's much that individuals can do within their own practices, places of work, but think about the systems that surround you and whether they enable or disable you in this work. If they are disabling you, then what are the avenues, doors that you need to put shoulders to, to change that? And that might involve looking up to system level, but I think there can be a degree of learned helplessness um, from those of us who are working um, kind of on the ground with patient populations. And actually, a lot of the bigger factors around us shape how much we can do locally. So think about that as well and how you can change some of the things that surround you as well as things directly in front of you. Thanks, Bex. That's great. Um, forgive me, I had the doorbell ringing just as I was taking myself off mute there. I'm going to uh, hand over to Pratesh for the last word just to give uh, us a, a key takeaway from, from his work. Thanks, Lisa. So I, I would say we need to remember one size doesn't fit all. We're all individuals, we're all unique in some ways. And so we need to tailor care, as Steve rightly outlined. Um, and we need to take a collaborative approach. It's not asking people to come to the system, but to flip it on its head and go out to communities. It means having organisational capacity, skills and staff and processes to work with partners in the community and its leaders and charities. It's not about the system on its own. It's about the partners around it as well. So there's many touch points people have in the healthcare journey. And it's how do we support that person in the holistic sense? Um, I'd lastly just add that when we are designing new models of care, we are basing it on the system that we already sit within. And so it's an evolution, not a revolution. Brilliant. That's a, a great way to finish off that discussion. Thank you to a really global um, perspectives uh, joining us from California, Alaska and uh, the UK. Um, and I'm going to close.